Let's look at a chi-square goodness of fit test. We know how to test whether a sample proportion fits a hypothesis population proportion, but what if an outcome does not fall into only two categories, like win-loss, hit-miss, success-failure? When we have more than two outcomes, we use a chi-square goodness of fit test to compare the observed outcomes to the expected outcomes. For example, in large sets of data, the leading, that is the first digit of the data, is usually not uniformly distributed from 1 to 9, but instead often follows Benford's law. Here is the probability that the leading digit will be this digit. So the probability that the first digit is 1 is 0 0.309. The probability that the first digit is 2 is 0.176, etc. Regardless of the unit of measure, the lengths of rivers, the heights of buildings, the population of cities, and the amounts of checks tend to follow Benford's law. When working for the Brooklyn District Attorney, investigator Robert Burton analyzed the leading digits of the amounts from 784 checks issued by seven suspect companies. The frequencies of leading digits 1 through 9 were found to be 0, 15, 0, 76, 479, 183, 823, 0. If the observed frequencies are substantially different from the frequencies expected with Benford's Law, the check amounts appear to result from fraud. Test the hypothesis that the check amounts do not fit Benford's law. Okay, find null and alternative hypotheses. The null hypothesis is that there's no difference. The stated frequencies are correct. We mean, in other words, these frequencies, oh yeah, yeah, those are the frequencies of the leading digits and the checks we're looking at. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a change, there is a difference. Not all of the stated frequencies are correct. Now, notice we say that not all of the stated frequencies are correct. That's not the same thing as saying they're all wrong. Some of them might be right, but at least not all of them are correct. Okay, here's our null hypothesis. This is the proportion of first digits that are 1. This is the proportion of first digits that are 2, etc. The alternative is that not all of the stated frequencies are correct. We want to do a chi-square goodness of fit test. Do the data satisfy the required conditions? Here's the counted data condition. The data are given as counts, not measurements or percentages. Okay, so you can't measure feet or pounds or something like that. They have to be counts. Independence assumption. Each subject that is counted is independent of the other subjects. An expected frequency, expected cell frequency condition. The expected values for each cell are all at least five. So we'll, yep, we satisfy these, as you'll see. Okay, let's calculate the test statistic. Now, again, this is chi-square. I know it looks like an X, but it's not. It's a chi. That's the Greek letter chi. It's not chi. It's chi. Chi-square is the sum of the observed frequency minus the expected frequency squared all over the, uh, the expected frequency. So here are our observed frequencies. Well, let's get them from here. 0, 15, 0, 76, etc. So in other words, uh, of the 784 checks, the leading digit was 1 on 0 checks. The leading digit was 2 on 15 checks, etc. Okay, as for our expected digits, uh, expected frequency, we get those from here. Now, what you don't want to do is say, okay, we expect, uh, well, the probability is 0 0.309, so that's what we enter as 1. No, no, that, that's not right. No, 0 0.309 is the expected probability Now, for one check. Now, since we have 784 checks, and the probability that one particular check begins with a 1, we'd expect 0 0.309 times 784, in other words, 242 of the checks to begin with a 1. Similarly, since this is the probability that a check begins with a 2, and this is the number of checks we have, we'd expect 138 of the checks to begin with a, uh, to begin with a 2, etc. So these are what we get for our expected frequencies. Okay, so here's our chart. Leading digits, observed, expected. Now we calculate chi-square. Observed minus expected squared over expected. So this first one, for example, is 0 minus 242, so that's expected, observed, minus expected, squared, all over expected. So it's all over 242. Same way, 15 minus 138 squared over 138, etc. And we just add all these up, and we end up with 3646.8. Now you're thinking, oh my gosh, is there a, we can find, is there a way we can find this test statistic chi-squared on a graphing calculator? Well, we can't do this directly on the TI-83. Uh, later calculators like the TI-84 can do the entire test. Uh, but if you've got a TI-83, here's the best way you can do it. And I'll go over this quickly, and then I'll show you how to do it. You press STAT, edit. 
you enter the observed in L1, enter the expected in L2, then you go to the top of L3 and enter L1 minus L2 squared over L2 at the top of L3. You press quit, and then sum of L3. The sum is available under list math. Got it? Just kidding. Now, okay, turn the calculator on. We're going to enter these data under stat and then edit. So L1, that's where we get the observed. 0, enter. 15, enter. There's nothing more exciting than watching a math teacher enter data into a calculator. It's just got to give you the chills. Okay, 183, keep going, 8, 23, 0. Okay, and then we toggle, then we toggle to the next column. So expected, 242, enter, 138, enter. And if you think this is tedious, in the old days, we couldn't even do this. I didn't have a calculator that could do this stuff. I just had a really simple, unsophisticated calculator. So be grateful for the days you live in. Okay, 45, 40, and 36. Okay, so we've entered the data. Should be the same number in the left and right columns. We're good. Now we go to the top of L3. Not there, but mind you, up here. And this is cool. Check this out. So in that top, we enter left parenthesis, L1, which is above the 1, so second 1, minus L2, it's above the 2, second 2, close parenthesis, and then we square it, and now divided by L2. Now check this out. Isn't that cool? So it automatically calculates L1 minus L2 squared over L2. That's great. Now, we don't want to sum those by hand. Instead, here's what we do. We quit. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, list and then math. We're going to choose that. Enter. So sum, it's under list and then math. We want to sum up what's in list L3. So sum of L3. And then bam, we've got what's in L3. 3646.8. So that's what we enter. That's that sum that we calculated earlier. Okay, now for the TI-84, it's a lot easier. Uh, you just enter these data. Observed, L1. That goes in L1. The expected, that's L2. You gotta enter those in the calculator. Um, and then you just enter the degrees of freedom, which in this case is eight. That's the number of categories minus one. And then you just enter calculate. And that is so cool. But again, that's available on the TI-84. All you gotta do is stat and then test and then choose this. Chi-square goodness of fit test. I wish I had a calculator like that. I don't. Determine whether we should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Use a 0.01 level of significance. Okay, the rejection region is chi-square is greater than chi-square star, where chi-square star is from the table at the back of the book. Chi-square tests are always one-sided tests. So we look at the chi-square distribution table at the back of the book, or you can enter chi-square table into a search engine. Here's what you end up with. You'll get something that looks like this. Now again, we want to be really, really sure before we haul these people before a judge. So we're going to set 0.01 as the level of significance, so we want this column. The row is the degrees of freedom. That's the number of categories, minus 1 and minus 1. So that's going to be 8. So we want this row. So it looks like our entry is 20.090. So that's what we get for chi-squared star. That's our critical value of chi-squared. OK, our value of chi-squared is a lot bigger than the critical value. So we conclude that the null hypothesis is false. We reject the null hypothesis. Not all the stated frequencies are correct. This indicates that the checks may be fraudulent. Okay, find the p-value. We can do this. We want the area to the right of chi-square equals 3646.8, so we enter chi-square a comma b comma d comma f. This is available under dister, so look for dister on your calculator. A is the left endpoint, b is the right endpoint to the interval, and df is degrees of freedom. So in this case, the left endpoint is 3646.8, uh, the right endpoint is infinity, but we don't have an infinity button on the calculator, so we just enter something ridiculously large, like 100,000, and then 8. That's our degrees of freedom. And when we do that, we get 0. That is our p-value. If the p is low, the null must go. So we reject H0. Now, there is very, 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 very strong evidence to conclude that not all the stated frequencies are correct, because 0 is ridiculously low as a p-value. Which values are most likely to have incorrect frequencies? Well, one way to do this is by looking at the standardized residual for each term. 
that's the observed minus the expected, all the square root of expected. Note that this is plus or minus the square root of the term that we saw earlier. We summed up those terms and we calculated chi-square. Okay, the first standardized residual will be observed frequency minus expected frequency over square root of expected frequency. That's 0 minus 242 all over square root of 242. That's a negative 1556. Okay, there's a quicker way we can do that. We can press stat, edit, uh, enter observed in L1, expected in L2, go to the top of L3 and enter L1 minus L2 over square root of L2 at the top of L3 and then enter. Or uh, let me show you how to do that on the TI. Okay, so here's what we do. We're going to go to the top of L4, and we enter this, left parenthesis, L1, minus L2, right parenthesis, divided by the square root of L2, close parenthesis. Bam! Look at those. So we have all those differences. And notice, uh, those are the same ones we've got over here. Okay, so a positive residual indicates uh, that means the observed is larger than expected. A negative residual means the observed, observed is smaller than expected. So for 5, and to some extent 6, uh, the observed is much larger than expected. For 1, and to a lesser extent 2 and 3, uh, the observed was much smaller than expected. And that fits when you look at these. Look, we observed this many 5s and 6s. We expected that. We expected you know, we observed this many 1s, 2s, and 3s, and we expected those. So, yeah, those numbers were way off.